full quorum here. Um, so we're going to uh, start the meeting at 6.05. Um, the purpose of the meeting tonight, we have a fair amount of planning board work that needs to be done, as well as some board uh, process clarifications and some monitoring that needs to be taking place. Um, it looks like we have a large number of folks that have come out, I'm assuming, for public comment. Uh, I just want to remind folks that there will be another public forum next week as well. Um, the, the board does appreciate comments from the public, but we also uh, have work that we need to do as a board. So we are welcome, we are happy to hear comments, um, but there is going to be some uh, monitoring of the amount of time uh, that's taken up with the board meeting. So while they're working on the tech issues, there are a board meeting agendas over on the table over there, as well as a sign-in sheet. So if you haven't signed in, we just need to um, know who's in attendance at the meeting. Hey, this is Rachel. Yeah, that's hey, Rachel. I can hear. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Rachel. You're hearing all right? Yeah. Now, usually, if, yes. uh, if we have a picture in the bottom corner and you see things moving up there, it's it's on, on the other person's head, usually. Great. So, yeah. Okay, so um, before we uh, start public comment, one of the things that we're trying to do is just make sure that we're clear about public comment at our board meetings. Um, the board welcomes comments, but it is not able to take any action on them other than to direct the public to the appropriate staff member or to the complaint procedure. Comments are limited to three minutes per speaker. Comments are to be addressed to me, the board chair, or the board as a whole, not to any individual on the board or on the staff or in the public. Please raise your hand and wait to speak until you are asked by the chair to, to speak. Please identify yourself with your first and last name in your town of residence. Please refrain from restating comments that have already been shared you can express agreement with the, those comments that have already been shared. Order and decorum shall be observed by everyone. Shouting and profanity are prohibited. As the board chair, I will maintain the order and decorum of the meeting. Would someone like to comment? Please raise your hand. I've got one person online. Okay. Marley, can you turn on your microphone? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, good. I thought this was going to be later. <laughs> uh, well, thank you um, to the whole uh, board for, for taking public comment. Um, this is uh, to do with the general temperature <laughs> of... Um, of Randolph lately. So I just kind of wanted to put some stuff out there um, for your consideration. Uh, the Wabanaki Confederacy lived on this land before Western Europeans came. And in the early 1900s, the descendants of those Europeans still living in Vermont and across the country, to be honest, decided that those who were different or deficient in some way should not be allowed to reproduce. 
I came to this land because my ancestors believed that the United States would keep them safe from anti-Semitism and that they would be accepted for just being human. Um, they weren't, and I'm not to this day in many occasions. And although I've not experienced anti-Semitism in Randolph, thank goodness, <laughs> um, I've heard that children of color have had to listen to their peers make jokes about them. I've heard about the mocking of foreign exchange students. I was told by a local parent uh, that being transgender is a disease and that the education system is pushing it like a drug on all kids. I was told that saying Black Lives Matter is a political statement and not an acknowledgement of a fact that so many people seem to forget. And sadly, humans tend to fear difference, even if it looks like them. Uh, fear is the driver for all relational problems. And when any emotion is shared among a group, that emotion is amplified, made worse, boundaries become meaningless, and logic loses ground, giving way to primal responses. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard now and again in the news about uh, what can happen when a stadium's favorite team wins a game. <laughs> and they wreak havoc on the town. Uh, fear works in the same way. And in this case, the group may feel a need to attack, subjugate, segregate, and sometimes eliminate what's causing that fear. Uh, I'm a parent. Um, I, oh, I'm sorry, I live here in town and I have a child going to school at, at the high school. Sorry. Um, when I was a teacher, I honored in loco parentis uh, by trying to treat every child as an individual and as if they were my own. And that included setting boundaries and uploading, upholding consequences. And as a mental health professional, I can say with 100% certainty that without understood boundaries and consequences, nobody does well, nobody succeeds. And that's because nobody feels safe without boundaries. Um, not the students, not the staff, and now not the community. And not ironically, the fear that causes to attack difference is, also, is caused by the same fear that occurs when boundaries and consequences are not consistently and firmly upheld. I am almost done. Um, as a parent and as a mental health professional, I'm asking you, the members of the school board, to take action to firmly halt the social and emotional battering that Randolph students and faculty are taking lately. Um, bullying isn't okay. Harassment isn't okay. Shouting the N-word in a hallway isn't okay. It's not okay that teachers or staff feel paralyzed communi by community threats. Students who are in any way different from the majority should never be made to feel. That close you at this point. Thank you very, thank much. You very much. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Wayne Townsend, a resident of Randolph. For decades, we have encouraged our youth to stand up when something is not right. Now, I'm some disappointed to see Mr. Millington try to silence these young ladies and gaslighting them into thinking they're doing something wrong. I'm also tired of the division and chaos Mr. Millington is trying to cause within our communities. I think it would be in all of our best interest if Mr. Millington stepped down from his position and we hire someone willing to look at some of the things from all sides with the moral values of doing something right. I was some disgusted to learn someone brought me up as a candidate after I left for work last evening, as I like to keep politics in these one-sided ideologies out of our schools, as neither one has any place within our schools. Again, I must leave to go to work because some of us have to work to pay the, for this poor representation we've been getting. And I yield my time to Mr. Helfont if he needs it. I was going to speak to me. I wasn't going to jump in right away, but if nobody else wants to speak. Okay. Um, so, I, yep, John Helfant, own property in West Brookfield and East Roxbury. I have three OSSD students. Um, I want to first talk about Aiden Buchanan, who no longer is an employee of the district, but that's not my concern. My concern is his hiring to begin with. So this is a man who has public posts that said he was going to set up sexuality workshops that targeted teenage boys. He has posts that uh, indicate that he is a communist, that he is an anti-capitalist, um, 
post that says, uh, I can't remember it, so I won't say it. Um, often hungry, easily confused, talking about sexuality. And I can't understand why, for the life of me, the board or the principals or the superintendent would have hired somebody to teach history that's a communist. Uh, no, we don't need communists teaching US history um, or social studies or whatever he was hired to teach uh, in that respect. Um, we also don't need to hire people who make public posts that they're going to target teenage boys. That's not acceptable. And whoever hired him, whether it be the board, the superintendent, or principals, quite honestly, they should be fired for one of two reasons. They either did a horrible background check or they did a, an appropriate background check and knew exactly who they were hiring. And we don't need a history teacher who puts on his official Randolph Union High School introduction uh, that they want students to come nerd out in the classroom about gay and trans issues. No, we hire a history teacher to teach history, and that's it. If you want to hire him to teach an elective uh, having to do with trans rights and homosexual rights, that's fine. And students who want to take that can take that, but not US history. Secondly, I know that this board or this superintendent uh, uh, sick their bulldog, Pietro Lin, on a parent, harassed a parent by calling their employer and filing a complaint against them. That is disgusting. And every one of you should resign. He should resign. If, you don't, if he doesn't resign, you should not renew his contract. And if you don't resign, I'm going to make it my mission in life to find people to run against you and get you off the board. Parents pay your salaries. Parents pay for that school system. You have no right to go after their income, none whatsoever. So since you went off after a parent's income, I'm going to go after yours by trying to get you out of office, all of you. Hi, Chris Hurley, Braintree, Vermont. I'm addressing the board tonight as a part of a group of parents deeply concerned as to the direction this district is going. Media attention was put on this issue as a result of the total mishandling by the administration and the total lack of handling by the board. The so-called solution of completely shutting down the locker room has now pointed out the lack of oversight and foresight in this district. The student who alleges the harassment has stated to her mother the coach overheard the remarks. Has she, the coach, been reprimanded for her mishandling of the situation? Why wasn't the coach in the locker room? This has never been driven by hate, rhetoric, or vitriol by the other side, as has been accused. As evidenced last night, not one comment or incident could be pointed to where hate was the motivation. Not one. This particular incident took place almost three weeks ago. The hacking of the website a few days later. As of today, there still has been no resolution to either issue. This is inconceivable. Meanwhile, an entire team is being denied access, which they also have a right to, while you, the board, stand by and do what? All these kids matter. All these kids have a right to feel safe and protected everywhere in their school. It is your responsibility to ensure that they do. The law states the student in question should be allowed in the girls' locker room. It does not state that student should be allowed to sit and watch them undress. There are some girls who are not comfortable with that, and rightfully so. They believe they are harassed. It is up to you to craft a solution. What are you doing to that end? This situation is not going away. We are no longer willing to allow you to use our children in your petri dish of social experimentations. We, the parents of the other students in the school, are not going away. We intend to monitor everything from here on in. We will hold you to the letter of the law in every situation, be it minutes, warnings of meetings, Decisions on policy and the proper implementation and distribution of said policies and procedures. It is long past time for the school board to do its job. Grassroots grow green on both sides of the fence. Thank you.
So I want to read a short statement that um, some of which we read last night. This is coming from, I'm also the uh, president of the teachers union, so this is kind of coming from our whole executive board. And then if I've still got time, I've got a couple other thoughts that I might try to share. Uh, but uh, so as educators, our most fundamental professional principle is the right of every child to feel safe at school. And I think I'm hearing some agreement, I think, with, with some of the folks who have spoken. Uh, and this is important for a lot of reasons, but probably the most fundamental and germane to this body is that kids can't learn if they're worried about whether they're safe. And that's their physical and their emotional safety. So that is, that is deeply felt and deeply understood, I would say, by everybody who works at our school, um, and most everybody who works in schools, period. I think we have to recognize that the, that the events of the past couple weeks have deeply damaged that sense of security for many of our students. Um, and I, as I said last night, you know, as somebody who has a daughter, um, I have a lot of empathy for the concerns that I'm hearing expressed by a lot of parents of the safety of young women in schools. Um, but I also have a lot of concerns, and frankly, right now, my concerns are much greater for the students who are part of our LGBT community and the children who have found themselves targeted by some really, really vile and threatening displays of hatred. Um, and and these, you know, the effects of this have really reverberated throughout our school to the point where there are many students, and I think we heard, for those of you who were at the public forum last night, Students articulate in no certain terms that they and friends of theirs are afraid. Um, and I think Marnie spoke to some of the things that are going on as well. Um, so I'm, I'm not saying this to point fingers, but just to, to, to point out that like it's a problem, right? It's a problem if kids are afraid to use the locker room, and it's a problem if, if kids are afraid to come to school. Um, I want to say to the students and adults largely those who are part of the LGBT community who I think have extra reason to feel unsafe given what's gone down over the last couple of weeks, as well as folks who may not be part of that community but may have close ties to that community um, and who have been you know, publicly misgendered and um, referred to in unkind and dehumanizing ways, that we see you and we care about you and you are welcome and you deserve to feel safe when you come to work, when you come to school. And we know it doesn't feel that way right now. And there are many of us in this community, and again, I think we saw this last night, we're deeply committed to doing whatever it takes to make sure that Randolph Union and all of the schools that are part of the Orange Southwest District are safe for every child. And I want to say to the whole community, we make the same commitment to all of your kids, regardless of whether the things that might jeopardize their safety have to do with their gender identity or their your family's religious or cultural background the language is spoken at school the the way that you worship or don't how much money you have the type of work the lifestyle your parents lead none of that matters what matters is that every child has a right to to, to feel safe but we need to recognize I, i'm almost done if that's okay um that we all have a collective responsibility because these are all, all of these kids are all of our kids. And I, I would just ask that whatever your take is on this particular incident, that we take very seriously the fact that there are numerous students who are feeling less safe than ever. And um, yeah, that, that I, I think we just need to really look at all sides of this issue of safety. Thank you. <laughs> mistakenly one day said, oh, she just ran in so many laps. And he had to apologize for using correct English. Who's an English teacher? They is plural, not this girl. Um, they no longer, my kids, my two youngest, no longer go to Randolph. They go to Websterville. And they're getting much better education. Um, it's, it's just really, really, really sickening that school, you're here to teach our kids. 
you're not here to mold them for your satisfaction or whatever. Um, I would, I really like to see the world go back to math, science, history. Not, I have nothing against indigenous peoples, but Christopher Columbus, that's part of history. Whether he was a great guy or not, that's up for debate, but. David? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm David White from Randolph. Um, I have kids in both high school and the elementary school. And um, I, I just wanted to make a comment in general support of Lane and this board. I've been coming to the board meeting for years now. I've been coming to the community forums that the superintendent puts on, that the teachers put on, that the principals put on. And I've been doing it for years. And there's never more than two, three other families that show up. And so I think their focus has been on academics. I've heard a lot of uh, very honest talk about test scores and what we're gonna do about improving those test scores. So until a hot button issue uh, like we're talking about tonight has come up, their focus has been on the academics and improving them. And it's, it's, the, uh, it's the community's fault for not paying attention and the other parents' fault for not paying more attention, but um, they have been very focused on academics. So um, I don't really understand the call for them to resign in, in any way. I appreciate their time and, and what they've been doing. As far as a transgender teacher being hired, we're talking about one teacher out of dozens of teachers. I find that very representative of the LGBTQ community. It's not like half or more of the teachers at the school um, are, are of a different gender identity. I think having one is a good idea to have a trusted adult for those students who, who are going through um, transgender um, identity changes or, or or somebody that they want to talk to. So I find that very supportive, not of a concern. Um, there was an email out introducing all new teachers, and I did read the comment about geeking out, and I didn't take it as a, in somebody wanting to indoctrinate anybody. I thought it, thought it was just being welcoming uh, outside of the school classroom to be a trusted adult to those students, to have somebody to go to and talk about those issues because they can be challenging. Uh, in no way did that comment indicate that they were going to change their curriculum or, or teach something different about U.S. history or the social studies. So I, I think the fear is a little overwhelming and a little overdone here. I think we're, we all we all need to take a step back and, and and see we're all trying to do the right thing for our kids and have have everybody be welcomed. Um, as far as the locker room, again, I appreciate the initial response and in wanting to make sure um, daughters are safe. Um, but I felt like there's been a good response from communication that I've read that there's options, there, there's stalls, there's private bathrooms. I'm not as close to the issue as others, but from what I've heard on the outside, it sounds like there are options and that it is being addressed. So I just wanted to share my thoughts and thank you to the board for your support. So I think the point's being missed, uh, that a history teacher wants to nerd out and gay and trans issues in the classroom. That is not why he is hired. I don't care if he's trans. He can be trans all he wants. He can be gay all he wants. I don't care. But it's about educating our kids. They're there to learn math, English, reading, writing, history, uh, not, not other social issues. Again, if you want to make that elective class, and kids want to participate in that, then make it an elective class and have them participate. But in mainstream education, it doesn't belong. Um, that's it. Uh, Avery McGill, I live in Randolph Center. Um, I would just like to point out that gay and trans people have been in the United States for a very long time. So that is part of US history. It is part of history in general. So covering that history can also help navigate today's world. Uh, 
Uh, Sarah Crosby is first. Sarah, go ahead. Your microphone is muted. There's also MB, I'm not sure who that is. MB, can you identify yourself in the town you're from? And go ahead and give us your comments. Sure, my name is Sure. My, my name is Mary Beth Jones. I have a grandson <laughs> in the school. I, I'd like to yield my time to John Helfant, please. My name is Travis Allen. I live in East Randolph or Randolph Center. Uh, my daughter is the one that brought this issue to light and she has not felt safe at the high school. And I can't really blame her for not feeling safe because in an incident earlier in the year, during gym class, she had a hockey stick broken across her leg by another kid in her class. So I would think that the school would take proper recommendations on that because I can't discipline the kid. She ended up getting stitches on her leg because it left quite a mark. The kid didn't get anything, didn't get any punishment. Would that make you feel safe to go to school? She had someone in the locker room watching her that was the opposite sex. She didn't feel safe about it. So she reported it. Nothing happened. This kid has made death threats multiple times. They've been deemed low. I, I, I'm not sure where feeling safe comes into play there. I would also, Mr. Millington, can I address him? Is that okay? Or I can address you. Is, was there a budget surplus last year? There was. Um, I'm just what I've been told, it's in the million dollar range. Listening to the forum last night, it sounded like nobody liked changing in the locker room. We heard from people from the past, graduates, alumni, students that are here. Nobody likes changing in the locker room in front of other, other people. So could we put that budget into use of putting in changing stalls? Because nobody wants to change in a single stall bathroom. I mean, if people go to the bathroom in there, not everybody's good at hitting the toilet. Stuff goes on the floor. I don't want to set my clothes on the floor where somebody's urinated. Can we appropriate money so that we can have changing stalls in a locker room so that seven or eight people can change at a time and then meet in a common area? And it sounds simple to me. And of course, it sounds simple to me because it's my idea. Thank you for your time. with the superintendent's dealing with that, then you can bring it to the board. 
Um, and our complaint procedure uh, spells out how you would do that. So that needs to be a written um, complaint to the board, but the board is more than happy to um, take up things if you follow. One of the things in the procedure is that you do need to follow that uh, that chain. So you want to first try and talk with the teacher and find out what's going on. Um, that doesn't sound like it is. Uh, it's okay for us to uh, direct them to the complaint procedure if that's the issue. And this clearly seems to be an, an issue where you have, you're asking how do I address it. So it's through our complaint procedure. Thank you. Sounds like I hear a noise from Sarah. Oh, Sarah, are you um, <coughs> unmuted and ready to give your comment? I think I've um, mastered the technology for the moment. Awesome. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. can you just tell us okay. what town you're from, please? I'm from Randolph. Um, my kids grew up and went to school here quite some time ago. Um, and I have worked in the community as a therapist um, for a long time, I'm now retired, but um, I, I, there's so many things I want to say. Um, one is that when I hear talk about grooming and indoctrination, I just want to clarify that, first of all, indoctrination is something that happens with ideas. Um, I think some, I've heard from some people that they're scared that their kids will become trans or gay because they get indoctrinated. And trans and gay isn't an idea, it's a way of being, it's, a, it's, a, it's an internal thing, it's not something you can make happen. When I hear the term grooming, um, I get quite upset. I've done a lot of work with kids with child sexual abuse histories, I have um, some very painful experiences that is in, in among myself and people I love. And to hear 14 year old girls talked about as if they are pedophiles, or 14 year old boys talked about as if they are pedophiles, is very disturbing. One of the things that happens is that it desensitizes people to some of that language like grooming um, and, and clouds issues and makes it easier for real pedophiles to get away with what they do. So I, I, I want to ask that we all sort of think about some of that language. Um, in, I, I could tell last night in the forum that there are, um, there's a lot of um, misinformation that is, is perfectly innocent. Nobody, nobody's deliberately trying to have misinformation, but I do wonder about helping the community get, get, some, get some learning about what trans is and I learned a lot from some of the speakers last night about um, the gender is not nearly as straightforward as just a man or a woman, scientifically and medically. Um, I, I, uh, I had another thought. Oh, don't let me lose it. Oh, dress. I'm getting old. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway, I, I've lost the other thought that I had. Um, oh, I, I guess I'm wondering. Would, would there be something that anyone could do, and I'm not just blaming the school, I mean, I'd be happy to help with being on committees or talking to kids or whatever. Um, would there have been a way that we could have prevented this by, by helping the girls who feel so unsafe having a transgender girl in the, in the, the locker room? Because those, you know, that comes from some kind of feeling that's a real feeling. And it may be based on misinformation. They referred to the, the transgender student as a man when, in fact, the transgender student is 14. So right there, there's already some misunderstanding and some fear that it's hard to avoid in this culture that, that all males are predators, and they, and they aren't. There's some wonderful males, including, I'm sure, in that room, and one sitting here in my room, who are not predators. To an end. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. Thank well, you. anyway, that, that was, those were the main things I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Larry Sackowitz, and I live in Randolph. And this is, it seems to be that part of our rules here are that we can share our time. I'd like to um, give my time to Sarah and Marty, who were both um, 
cut off for lack of their time. Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't understand what he was saying. Am I being offered more time? Yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, thank you. Um, let me see. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess I feel as though we do need to take the concerns seriously by girls who don't feel safe for whatever reason. It makes perfect sense to me that a trans student wouldn't feel safe in the, in the locker room of either gender. Um, and it does feel, make, make sense to me that, that girls who feel awkward anyway are going to have, this is an added factor, is would there be a way, and I'm not asking for an answer, I'm, this is a question for us to raise, what could we do to help um, the other girls understand what, what the risks are, what makes them feel so awkward, and if we try to, to do that, are we then going to be accused of indoctrinating people, um, which is, that, that, that belief about indoctrination, I think we need to do some work to um, defuse people's worries about that. Thank you. Do we have any more time left? Yes. Marnie, we have how much time do we have? Uh, six minutes. We have two uh, minutes left if you'd like to add something. I actually just, I, I have a couple of paragraphs left, but I really, I, um, I wanted to recommend a, and I have nothing to do with this particular organization, but there's- If you want to put my other computer up, I might be able to fix it for you to get on. Well, you're, you're, on you're, mute, you're unmuted, Sarah. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, there are, there are um, nonprofits that will, will come to a, 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 an SU and um, help the, the students, the teachers, the admin, the parents in the community sort of re reframe how, uh, I guess, social emotional um, interaction. And, um, and I am happy to share the one organization I found that I absolutely adore, and it's like $9,000 for an entire year of the, this service. Um, and, and also, I volunteer as a, you know, as a mental health professional as well to come in, and I have a huge background in tra the trans community, to come in and talk to the to the kids, parents, to teachers. I, I'm, I live around the corner. I'm I'm happy. I'm at your service. So if you want that resource, I can send it in through Katie or or into you guys directly if you're interested in looking into it. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say, as a parent of two boys in the school system, um, I obviously want them to learn math and science and reading and all those basic things. But it's also critically important to me that they learn much more as far as critical <coughs> thinking, discussion, debate, being expo exposed to all kinds of ideas that are out in the world. And um, I just hope and expect and hold the board accountable to hire teachers that broaden their horizons. Thank you. Sam Hooper, Brookfield. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the school board, Lane, officers for the public forum last night. I found it very productive and um, I was happy about the civility of it. I would like to remind the community that we are talking about people's lives here and people need to be very careful about how they talk about this conversation, regardless of your opinion on it, but that you are you are messing with people's lives and, how they feel, and whether they feel safe or not. So please be strategic, please continue to educate yourselves, and please do not throw fuel on the fire because we're in a weird spot right now as a community and it's, 
kind of teeter-tottering on whether something significant will happen here or whether we can come together as a group and move forward. And so those of you who are in the hot seats, I appreciate your service and, uh, and, and, thank, you, and thank you for navigating this as a there as well I just like to point that out I have a question for the superintendent how many single occupant uh, bathrooms are near the gyms somebody can correct me but that's my understanding and that is not nearly enough for an entire volleyball team to change in a quick amount of time I would like to point out that uh, 51 to 52 percent of the US population are women about 0.5 percent are intersex people so um, clearly the women need more ability to have space to change use the facilities, if there's showers, I don't even know if there's showers. Um, they need more space, because there's just more of them. Um, again, I propose that times of access should be created. I understand that access must be granted to trans students per the policy, for locker rooms. I made a very simple proposal. If practice starts at 3, have the trans student occupy the area from 2.30 to 2.45. Have the biological girls occupy the area from 2.45 to 3. It seems pretty simple to me. That's not discriminatory. It's just providing a lack of anxiety for all the students and safety for all the students. Uh, just like to make a point that one of my children's advisories did tell them that there was more than two genders. So there is instruction going on from the school on this. Um, and I'm not hearing much the other way, that there are only two genders. Um, some of the uh, you know, intersex arguments are that there's a whole bunch of genders. Um, and there are some abnormalities in the human genome. Sometimes there are what are known as triple X syndrome people. Um, and they are female, and they have female characteristics. There are also people with Kleinfelter syndrome who are XXY people, and they have male characteristics. And most people go through life not even knowing that they have these syndromes. Um, and, and those are people in American society who make up that 0.5%. Uh, they are Americans. They are protected by our Constitution. They have all the rights that all of us have. And I agree with that. Um, but I, I think it boils down to the sexual organs of a person and that people are uncomfortable dress changing or going to the bathroom in front of other people that are different than them in the sexual organs. And um, I think we need to make uh, allowances for women to feel safe, young women, uh, in the school. If I have any time left, I yield it to Sarah. Okay, I just thought I would try.
agenda, so that um, will be you, Alicia. Okay. So, um, hello everybody. Thank you for having me here again to discuss our CLNA that we did for the Tech Center as part of our Perkins plan. Um, the reason I'm here a second time is because the, the plan needed a little bit more work on the data end of things. So, the files that you received in your email have all of that data in the sections. Um, but essentially, the information that we discussed the last time is the same. Um, I think the only thing that I didn't address a lot was probably the staff retention and recruitment piece. Um, so, you know, at this point, I guess I would just like to open it up for questions regarding the changes. And I would like to say also that the Regional Advisory Board has approved this second draft. Could you discuss what you've done so far to implement your retention strategies? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so some of the things that we've been doing to work around um, having folks want to remain employed at RTCC is we have looked at providing them PD opportunities to work on their scope and sequence, which I think is an integral part of feeling confident in their work. Um, we've also created more transparency in the leadership by revamping our leadership team so that it involves um, many more staff members for equal representation of staff and non-teaching staff. Uh, we've also refocused our attention on being student-centered versus adult-centered by revamping our MTSS team. Um, we've also empowered our students to have more of a voice and ownership in the center through our student ambassador program. And then we're also trying to make bridges to our community. And one of the examples is bringing our regional advisory board that just met prior to this into compliance where all schools are represented and our community is also represented. Tonight while I'm here, uh, we actually have our, all of our teachers are meeting with their program advisory committees. And um, so those are real good support systems for our staff. Um, we also this year adjusted our master schedule, which I think has alleviated a lot of the pressure that I think we were feeling up until this year. Um, that pressure was created by the consistent pullouts for academics. At this point, we have asked all of our students to attend math, to attend their English humanities, and to attend science, so that everybody's gone to those programs at the same time, and that allows a couple of things to happen. One, the content can be more relative to the program, and secondly, um, it allows the instructor and the academic instructors to collaborate and to make it more meaningful and relevant. So, um, so that's a couple of things. We've also, um, we're looking at negotiating language for RTCC, which currently, um, if you came to our school having taught prior to this position, uh, the years of experience would count as half of what you have served. Um, so that's just a language blip that's been there for many, many years that just needs to be um, fixed up. And so I think staff feel like that is gonna be a good thing for not only recruitment, but for retention. Um, and then, you know, one of the things we've also done is we meet with our facilities crew bi-weekly, which has really helped communication and to ensure that they know the goals and mission of our building and what needs we might have. So those are just a few things we've done so far that I think have helped staff feel welcome. So um, I think at this point, I'm just seeking if there's any other questions before I... I'm in need of a motion to accept the second draft of our CLNA document. So moved. Second. second. Second from Chelsea. All those in favor? Uh, yeah, all those in favor. <laughs> Sorry. Aye. 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 Thank you. I appreciate your time, everyone. Thank you, Felicia. Thank you. Let me know if you have any other questions on it. So next up, uh, we have our ownership linkage subcommittee. Um, Tatcha, that we were trying to meet. Yeah, we have not met just due to the circumstances surrounding this meeting. Okay. So uh, that.
subcommittee is going to meet between now and, and the November. next meeting. Okay. We are, if anyone is interested in joining that committee, we are now down one member. Right. Will you remind the board who's on that committee? Um, myself, Anna, and Anna and Scott. Anna Scott, yeah. Okay. So, if, so Meg may, may join us. You've noted that, Katya? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't think we vote. We didn't vote on a subcommittee. Uh, yes, we did. So, we voted um, on I the members and the. Megan, uh, join the subcommittee for the ownership package. I second that. Okay. Uh, any discussion on adding Megan? To the ownership linkage. Is that Sarah the second bit? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, so, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Aye. That passed unanimously. Um, and hopefully, we will be meeting between now and, and our November meeting. Uh, so, next up, we have the um, Complaint procedure. So the last time when we were going over the documents that we had um, gotten together for orienting uh, new board members and just um, clarifying for the board um, how we operate, um, there were some concerns with some of the language in our complaint procedure that we might want to change. So. Um, and I believe, Rachel, you had some things that you had seen um, that you thought maybe needed to be addressed in that, in that uh, procedure. Yeah, yeah, I think my concern is that when people appeal to the board, it's not clear that what the board is, dis like we're not rejudging the whole situation. We are judging whether the administration has has acted arbitrarily or whether they have followed policy um, that we've laid out for them. So if, if people are coming to us for a, for a, like a fresh judgment on the situation, um, they would be disappointed by the process. So I think it needs to be clear that the process, uh, what the process is, that it's not that we go through a whole nother investigation or, um, Rejudge the situation. Right, right, right. So do, you, do you have some um, edits or some things that you've seen <coughs> that you feel would would clarify that better? Um, I hadn't come up with anything <coughs> specifically, but I think it's something worth talking about as a board. Um, changing the wording so it's clear that we're what we are what an appeal to the board is asking of the board yeah so maybe in that little preamble um, there where it says in the event an issue or concern arises that a complainant feels requires some kind of official resolution the following five steps should be Maybe we work on some language that's a little bit clearer because even that well, I, is a little. I mean, I think even in reading that, it just looks like it's this is for employees who are because it mentions employee supervisor, the employee. It doesn't mention you know it reads as like this is only for internal staff members in reading this. This is not. It's not. It's not vague enough to say like this is how this is the process for individuals. Members or staff. And the majority of the internal staff have a process to find their right. staff. Yeah, so that's right. why I was actually surprised to read that on here. Because I'm, I'm assuming we're saying we're stating a complaint procedure for it sounds like community members who feel like their concerns have not been addressed appropriately by, appropriately by the administration. And this reads as if an employee has not had their it hasn't been resolved by their supervisor, the next step is principal and the next step is superintendent. So this, this needs to reflect who we're actually addressing this to. So what right. would be our steps to 
form a committee to like go through it? To go through this? Do we want to? Do we want to do that? Do we want to? I mean, I think if we are offering this up to the public as a way to address concerns, it needs to reflect mm -hmm. what we're actually, right. what we're actually right. doing. So how do we right. want to work on this as a board? Do we want to have a committee do it? Do we want to use board time to, to um, go through it as a group? Um, how do we want to update or edit the procedure? That because all board members would be a part of um, the, you know, if it came to appeal, we should all work on it together rather than mm -hmm. as a committee. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm assuming there's a very, this is very, I don't want to say easy, but in a sense, there's other districts I'm sure have a complaint procedure, and it's probably a pretty, like, boilerplate, like this, is, these are the steps. I don't think ours are any different, or very, very, from what we've seen in other districts. So I think it might just be worthwhile. Um, I'm happy to do that, just gather what other districts have as their complaint procedure to, for us to be able to compare that. Um, but I, I just feel like this is something that we should have done in a relatively timely manner if we're, again, telling right. people to, to Mm -hmm. this right. right. Well, and I, right I, now these are, are all be these are all in our district at our different schools yeah. for people so to pick up. So over. we would want to, you know, get it updated. Probably should have Pietro take a look at it yeah. just to make sure that it's, um, you know, that we're not saying something or doing something that. Uh, and it would it would cover it's confusing. Groups. It would cover. Um, you know, parents, students, community members, but it would also cover non-union staff. So, so there's not a current one? Well, you could call them stakeholders. But Can we just replace employee with stakeholders in the short term? It's what we use with non-union staff. I think that's fine as long as we write in here somewhere, stakeholder, you know, like, Again, I think a stakeholder, it, is stakeholder is this, this, and this. Yeah. Clarifying. Maybe that's all we'd like, like to do. Oh, about here after known as stakeholders yeah. kind of thing. So where are you, where are you um, at the very, at the two and three, two and three, if the complaint involves an employee, the employee will have an opportunity to explain it and or present it, present the facts as he, she sees them, so maybe just stakeholders. And remove that to they. And then three also has. Uh, yeah, all of the and his version. I don't think right. individuals yeah. immediate supervisors, so um, should be brought to the appropriate staff member, or how would that be? Um, should we list like I don't know if it's like teacher advisor or because we well, have that it's like they're supposed to go to the teacher first then if that's they feel like that's not whoever solved. they're having the complaint with and then it would be like, whoever's in charge of the, that yeah right. that that unit or organization or the organization for my staff member. Yeah, ninety percent of the things can, are worked out. Usually, people just sit down and talk. About it. So, in what circumstance, Katya, would supervisor not be <coughs> appropriate? Because these are complaint. This is a procedure for complaints about people in the district, right? Right. So. Well, I think I'm just to so. If there's, a, I mean, I think in the different wording here, it was um, concerned individuals' immediate supervisor. Mm -hmm. So that was not appropriate wording there because it wouldn't. If I'm a staff member, I might take it to my supervisor. But if I'm a community member, who am I taking it to? Like, I'm taking it to a teacher. Or I'm taking it to the individual like, and the appropriate in question or whatever. Um, 
I think then, yes, then after, if the complaint cannot be resolved by the, by the employee's supervisor, you know, by the, then it should be brought to the next, I just think supervisor makes it sound like we're, this is only, em, employee supervisor makes it sound like we're just, this is just concerning employees, not. So you want to make sure that it can also apply to if the complaint is against another student? No. That's what I'm trying to ferret out here. Yeah, now usually this is if there's a complaint against a, Person, of course, an employee or a volunteer. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the way they have it worded is probably okay. Because I'm, I, I'm not trying to be <laughs> argumentative. I just, who could a complaint be against that doesn't have an immediate supervisor? What, what? Maybe if we back up and we think about what are the types of complaints that, you know, that we might hear. We might hear a parent who's upset with something that a teacher has done or you know the teacher hasn't responded to their child in a certain way so our first first thing we want them to do is go to the teacher which would be the individual concerned and then if the individual so that would be the individual concerned, and then the, indiv the concerned individual's immediate supervisor would then be the principal. Or say your child was, you know, had a one-on-one -on -one para, and there was a problem, then they would, the paras are usually supervised by the classroom teacher, is that right? Uh, the special education teacher. Or the special them. educator. Be the, SPED director, the SPED director, you know, just so that people know. Again, it's just sort of getting them to understand that they need to go through the, you know, if they can, and if they feel comfortable. That, that's the other piece, as we, you know, I have had people say, well, I'm afraid to say something, but um, my response usually is, these are professionals, and you know, if you truly have a concern, it's important to talk to them. But can you make an anonymous complaint? I mean, some one should be able to do that. Yeah, I suppose. We we have an anonymous system for students to be able to file complaints. Parents could do that. Uh, right. It's a little bit difficult, if especially through a union proceeding, because if it works its way through the steps. Eventually, at some point in time, you have a right to present witnesses and confront your accuser. So that could make things problematic. If usually what happens in those cases is we investigate, and hopefully there's enough information in that anonymous report that you can check in with people that are on the periphery who are, who are direct witnesses, and sometimes we get enough information that way. Uh, but that might pose a problem. That would be a major question. Right. Everybody this, has a right to due process. You can't have fair due process unless you can actually ask questions of the person accusing you. Right, but as, as an example of a workaround, I guess you could call it, with a Title IX complaint, it can the, the Title IX coordinator can submit that complaint on behalf of someone if that person doesn't want their name on the complaint. Yeah, so if, if they get enough information, but they have to also have enough information to be able to say that I, I'm filing this complaint because there's enough information to tell me that something may be going on. Yeah. Right, because they've met with the complainant, yeah. they're, but they're keeping them anonymous and saying. Yeah. But there is, again, it's, it's potentially, and again, it's a Pietro question. In a grievance process that's spelled out in the CBA, uh, there is usually a right for folks to, right? And it's kind of like the appeals that we did. Um, I don't usually share my full investigation notes with anybody. Those are. Those are for me, based on my decisions, usually what people get is the findings. But the reason in those appeals that you got the whole package, right, just like the, the person um, you know, asking for the appeal got, was because how are they supposed to put on a case in their own defense if they don't have that information? Um, it's very hard to do. So there's some complexities there that PH, PHO would be able to put in. But it's a good, good question, and I don't have the perfect answer for you. I just have fragments. Of, and we got off track. I'm well, sorry. no, I would say, I mean, I, I've just read through this like three times, and I guess it, it is, as it says, I mean, I think just reading it the first time, it was, it just sounded a little bit um, not as clear, but now that I've read it a number 
times, I feel like I can, I can see where the outline is that it should be. I would just recommend that the language would change in general. To they there. I, I think the biggest issue we have to grapple with is step 10 that says the board will make a decision to resolve the complaint. Mm -hmm. Which, okay, we're bringing it to yeah. an end, yeah. right? Because the, the, the decision of the board is final, but there's an implication there that we're going to resolve the give complaint. A judgment. Right. Yeah, I think that's right. where um, so what that's Rachel said is, exactly. is can yeah. be yeah. the language there can reflect that what the board is actually doing in this situation. You're, We're making a decision on the process that right. got it to us. Yeah, right? you're, you're, you're technically the court of last resort. That's your quasi-judicial duty. And so usually what you, what you do is, is was the process followed? And the other question is, is were the findings reasonable given the information? Mm -hmm. So those are usually the two things that you look at. You don't have to go and redo the entire thing, but you should be able to confidently say those two things if you're making a decision. Yeah, it looks like the process was followed, and yes, a reasonable person based upon the information that they have would have come to the same conclusion or something similar. So, yeah. so I, and Rachel, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Rachel is suggesting that we make clear that that is the Those decision we're making. And that. also, if we find that, if the board finds that it wasn't reasonable or that a process wasn't followed, that the board would, then initiate its own investigation? I don't know what that meant. Or push it, that's a question for Pietro, or push it back down and say, hey, you didn't do the, you didn't do the procedure right, do the procedure properly and, and review your findings. Uh, again, it depends upon what the case is. Yeah. But so, I should say that, I feel also at the very end, like that's what we're deciding, not, you know, if you can So maybe, whatever. would that be an addition to step nine where it says, after reviewing any new information, the board will review and discuss all the information relative to the, to the complaint. The board will be judging whether or not the process that was followed was reasonable and that the actions of but the- Barring any unforeseen circumstances, the board will make a decision to resolve the complaint. The decision will consist of a review of um, whether or not proper procedures were followed and whether the findings were reasonable given the evidence at hand. Yeah. No, I couldn't say it again. But it's being recorded. <laughs> yeah, so that, um, so 9 and 10, it looks like 9 and 10 is where we need to maybe uh, change the language a little bit. Um, did anybody write that down? It's on tape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Do you know what your timestamp is right now? Uh, 149, one hour and 49 minutes. Okay. Perfect. So it was about 10 seconds, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay. And that's, I think, where Pietro can also. Right. So, so, um, so we can, what we can do is maybe go back and, and fill in that language and then um, do we, and we want to change, we want to just add that language in and get rid of this, the board will make a decision to resolve the complaint, correct? Well, well I think, no, we, no, I think that's what we do. We are resolving but based it. on. Okay. All right. So we'll take uh, we'll take a look at what we what we had said. Um, I can I can go back and do that once the the um, video is posted. I can also just talk with Pietro about nine and ten and just um, explain to him that um, it's. You know, we're trying to be clear that what we're looking at is the reasonableness of the process and um, and the outcome for the and the decision that's been made. The administration. I just have a decision. I just have a question about um, about proceed. So this is a procedure, not a policy. Is this yes. 
if we change the language here, does this need two readings like a like a policy does? I don't think so, because it's a procedure. Okay. Right. So is the board okay with me um, getting that wording down, running it by Pietro, and then bringing it to the board at the next meeting? Yes. Does that yes. Yes. sound okay? All right. So do I we have to vote to give you that power, Anne? You, yes, you should do that. Yeah. So I need a I move that. Go ahead. I move that. I move that we give Anne Kaplan the responsibility and right to talk to Pietro on our behalf regarding the procedure for uh, the wording on the procedure for, for complaint resolution. Second. 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 Uh, any more discussion on giving me the authority to talk with Pietro about the complaint procedure wording? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Rachel, you can't see me. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Rachel, for um, bringing that to our attention. Um, I am, I, I am still working with Pietro on, uh, I was going to, review um and i'm not sure if i don't think i necessarily included no i did not um it was from our prior agenda the um the way that we were gonna handle emails i wanted to just run by him uh to make sure that we were um not uh, breaking open meeting law by uh, having, uh, we had decided that I would respond to them, but I would copy the board to make sure that everybody knew and saw that we responded to people. Um, but I still, I haven't gotten clarification from him. He's been pretty busy and with everything that went on. So um, I will, when I talk to him about the complaint procedure, we'll, we'll hammer that out and then that will um, hopefully be um, all set and everything that we have in that packet from the last meeting where it just sort of goes over the basics of how we're going to manage our meetings um, will be finalized. And then um, if you remember, that's all going to go into a little binder like this one. And you will all have not only our policies, but that information, the procedures in there. Um, that's going to mean you're going to need to be um, photocopying that. And Chelsea and I have talked, and we we would help you out if you feel like you need some help. If you send me what you want, I can do. Okay, it. I have to get it all um, yeah approved first um, before we include it because I don't want to put it in there. Um, until it's all been just looked at by Pietro and make sure that it's uh, good to go. All right. Okay, so next up, um, the outline for the board officer duties. Um, and I didn't bring my computer and I didn't. Do you have them? Okay. I didn't print it off either. Yeah, and I didn't print it out. I thought I'd bring my computer, and I was running a little late getting out here. So uh, that will be included in that packet anyway, because that's that. Basically, Chelsea and I met. We um, we went over it, and we just added it into that procedures for the board it's like to a just one sort pager. of. Or an addition, it's in the yeah. Remember, we in added it right. within yeah. the the welcome page. We mm -hmm. added it in. So remember, in the beginning, it says you know approximately how much time it takes to be on the board, and then we outline the duties um, in there right underneath 
that part. So um, I apologize. I didn't. I think I e I sent that out to everybody via email beforehand, I believe. Um, but I didn't send it to get put in the packet. So um, we can just take a look at that again um, when we're looking at the, the whole thing. Which, are you, uh, I guess what I'd like from the board is, do you want to give me authority to make the final, once Pietro looks at everything, make the final, okay, this is good, so that we can get it all collated and put together? So moved. Second. So moved. Okay. And second from Gotcha. Uh, okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So, Aye. Rachel. Okay. And you've all seen most of it. These are just tiny little edits to, to what was there. And we just added things like you have to go to an agenda meeting on Mondays and how much time that's going to take. It's not, okay. we, we didn't add anything surprising, I don't think. Uh, okay. So next up, we have uh, the EL 2.1, 2.2. Um, these are, we're just, these are the new ones first coming reviews, out. Yeah. First review. Yes. So, um, so again, when we think about even the situation that has happened, uh, the beginning of the school year, we can look at this um, policy in light of that to, to just, you know, for reassurance about whether or not, you know, we have things in place um, and the interpretations that we're getting and the evidence that we're getting um, makes us feel uh, confident that our superintendent is being accountable to us. Uh, remember that these are looking at a past school year, um, so it won't necessarily include uh, this year, but we can always ask for um, an additional monitoring report if anybody has concerns. Is there anything you want to point out, Lane? Uh, as we look at these to review? Just the basics. Um, 2.1, treatment of students, parents, guardians, and community um, is pretty much centered around uh, seeking to ensure that the district is treating folks fairly by applying its processes and its procedures. Right? That's usually how you ensure that, that folks are treated fairly is you, you've got your handbook, the rules that you follow, and you apply them equally to everybody. 2.2 uh, is treatment of staff. And that's really about ensuring that all job classifications are covered under rules that outline expectations and provide pathways to some grievances. A little bit of about what you were just talking about. Okay. Uh, and remember, there are binders um, for any confidential information uh, that, are, that are used for evidence um, in the central office. Um, you can go by and take a look at. Um, are you using any, usually he'll mention in his evidence section <coughs> that there's stuff There's, there's two the big notebooks full, okay. full of stuff that folks want to look. But it, it mentions most of what's in there. Yeah. Okay. If, it, if it wasn't included directly. Can I ask a very um, question that just kind of came to my mind here? So, um, and this is because I think that this is the first year that we've had an assistant superintendent. Mm -hmm. Is there any monitoring the board like that to come into our purview in any way because we are not okay, the direct she, supervisor? Maybe yeah, so she's, she's she, in, a, in, a, in a very inhuman way, she is an operational tool to help us achieve our ends. Okay. Yeah. Same thing with me. That's, that's uh, I'm a tool that the board uses to hopefully try to reach the ends that she said. See that as a board and we monitor that. Yeah. So I just wanted to make sure there was no, as an assistant superintendent. No. 
She, um, we spend time, um, especially this year, we talk about the executive limitations reports and what they mean. Uh, one of the discussions we had today, in fact, was um, about applying for grants and making sure that we have all the documentation we need in case we're audited um, and kind of where that falls under the EL reports. So, and part of that's the succession planning as well. Good question. Um, all right, so next uh, we have, uh, Lane was gonna make a few changes um, to uh, his... Uh, I think I highlighted them in yellow for you. The ones that Thank you. Requested. And that was, uh, there were only two. There were three that were up for a vote, two there were requested changes that were made, but all three are there for the vote this time because that other one never got voted in. Are there any questions on these? So uh, we need to have a uh, motion to accept uh, EL 2.0, 2.8, and 2.9. I have a motion. I make a motion. Sarah is making a motion to accept 2.0, 2.8, and 2.9. We have a second. Second. Seconded by Megan. Any discussion regarding? Uh, these EL policies and accepting them. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Aye, aye. aye Rachel. Uh, next up, uh, we have a first review. This looks like it is a state required policy. Is that correct, Lane? Uh, hold on. No, no, no. Hold on. Here. Yeah, this is actually um, more than it's more than a state required. Um, this is one of the policies uh, from our auditor. Um, it's okay. not really required, but they've cited that you know it might be a good idea. If you oh this. yes, yes, so we I remember. We wanted to make sure that we covered that board. just because mm -hmm. it was there. Um, it's just about conflict of interest and procurement. You know, making sure that we're doing things right in terms of what we're buying and purchasing. a couple other changes that you'll have other policies in the future so I need to clear my head and remember which one this was. Yeah, I'm just trying to follow through on the auditor's recommendations. Mm -hmm. Any questions? That is the email chain and then the policy. I think this was, Lane, why did you include the email chain? Or maybe that wasn't uh, with Heather. With Heather, she's the PA Yeah. Uh, where is it? Just before, uh, just before oh. that, you've got a. I don't know, maybe that was in there inadvertently. Let me check. I gotta see it. Oh, oh. and in training. Was that's oh, that's training. documentation okay. yes. because you had asked for me to supply the date and proof that it, they had done the training. Yeah, uh, got it. So that's documenting. Heather was the one that performed the training for Title IX with folks, and so it's got the date in there and whatnot. Okay. Thank you. Right. Yeah, so that goes with uh, one of the EL reports. Yeah. Okay. It's a good question. All right. And then we've got. Uh, 
first review. So that just means we, we look it over and then we're gonna do a second review next month. So um, you can take a look at it. Does anybody have any questions now regarding this policy? Um, again, it's coming from that uh, our audit um, of last year and it was recommended by the, the auditor that we have a policy like this in place. Any Does questions? this issue come up often? Which one? The conflict of interest. Uh, no, we follow our procedures. <laughs> but is it hard? Like, I would think in such a small town, like everyone's related to everybody working for everybody bidding on all the jobs. And, and, and we're, we're, we're very careful. Again, I think the bi the biggest one that we follow that's kind of above and beyond this is you know it's one of the reasons when you know it's forty thousand above now we go out to bid on everything uh, to make it fair to give everybody equal opportunity to be able to be the service provider for us. Uh, but uh, we don't we don't want nepotism. We don't want coming into this process. Okay. Any other questions? board budget to um, decide on and if you remember from the last meeting we need to make our budget for um, for next year which is kind of hard because we we haven't even made a plan for what we're going to be doing next year in terms of our specific board work or board training needs that we we might want to have um, so it makes it a little bit hard. Uh, in the past, um, and I, I asked Lane for this information, and he gave it to me. So you guys, you guys have spent about three thousand dollars in a normal year. You had one year, um, I think it was when Winton was here, where you were going to be about fifteen hundred over. So we just pulled that out. Uh, usually, I set aside ten thousand. Usually you spend three thousand at the year that Winton was here. You know you spent about ten five about that. So some of it, would, the decision would be around. You know, are you going to be doing more than normal? Do you plan on bringing in other trainings or doing things more intensely than the money? And if, and this is for not this year. It's for next year. Yeah. So again, ten thousand for this. We have ten thousand currently. For this current year, yeah. Um, so I have a, if we budget it, doesn't mean we have to spend it, but Those if we disturbance. don't budget, then we don't have it. Yeah. Um, and it seems to me that, I mean, I will say as the board chair and trying to move this board forward, um, you know, working with someone to help us with ownership linkage, I would like to continue to push us to get the training, to maybe get bring in a facilitator to help us so that we feel confident in doing that. So I I would like to stay with 10,000 for next year just because it gives us a look. And it's it's not as if it's adding millions of dollars to the surplus. Million dollar budget, 10, I, I moved to keep at $10,000 for the 2020. Uh, so we are, have a budget of 10000 for the 23-24 fiscal uh, year, is what we call it, right? Yeah. Uh, any discussion regarding that? I would just say that uh, if you don't use it, it goes into the surplus. Um, in the last couple of years, I've been using the surplus. It just goes back into subsidizing so people don't have to pay as much taxes. That's what the bulk of it's been going. So, you know, there'll be less money they have to pay the next year if it's not used. So, all those in favor, aye. say aye. 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 Rachel, are you there? Aye. Aye. Aye, aye Rachel. <laughs> okay. All right. 
So there you have our budget request. Uh, Lane. Uh, next up, uh, Lane is going to just fill us in a little bit. Um, normally around this time, we're beginning to um, get information on how we're doing toward our, toward our ends or the outcomes that we're looking for as a district. Um, and Lane has some information yeah. for us regarding that. So, and a, a couple of things, I might go a little over. It shouldn't be much more than the 15 minutes that's planned, but I think given some of the comments, um, the last two days of the forums about the school not being performing, um, I think it is important to share the data that we do have yes. um, so that the community can see that. Um, in terms of the ends, to so start off with the, the ends report for this year, uh, I want to ma make sure I got my notes so I hit all the important points here, but um, most of the interpretations in the ends reports require state data as a measure of progress. Um, the aggregated state data for 2021-22, remembering that ends look backwards, they look at last year's data, including the SBAC and Vermont Science Assessment is long overdue. We do not have it from the state as of this time. So it's very hard for me to make comparisons of how we're doing against the state if we don't have the state data. Um, in trying to prepare the report, we reached out to the AOE to get an expected release date. They said maybe sometime in November. Now, following that uh, email about, you know, potentially we'll, we'll be able to get the SBAC data out in November, on October 5th, um, Secretary French announced uh, for the first time, and with very little foreshadowing to the districts across the state, that it was doing away with the SBAC and the Vermont science exam. You know, there were some rumblings about things that they were looking at. It looked like they might be doing that, but nobody ever really talked about the fact that they were serious about it. And replacing them with an assessment from Cognia. They intend to implement Cognia this spring using a new system that no one has seen or used or been trained on. So it looks like we're going to have our work cut out for us trying to get this in place by April and up and running and having the kids taking the, these tests when that testing window is open. Aside from the disruptions of the new system and what it's going to cause uh, to districts across the state, there is an impact um, because it's yet another change. Uh, in my time here, about five years, the AOE has changed from the kneecap to the SBAC. It changed the science testing to the Vermont Science Assessment. And then it changed the grades in which the assessments are administered. And now we're replacing the SBAC and Vermont Science Assessment with Cognia. Not to mention the fact that um, stated testing data and information from the state is late. You know, in some cases, it's years behind. We're responding to things they want us to do in special education from data that is two to three years old. Um, so it, it's not a really good system. And the problem is, is that for the systems to be useful, they need to be in place for long periods of time so that we can track trends, right? Unless you get three years of what's happening in terms of student growth, you don't know what's happening. And we have not had a three-year period where they have not changed around the data points that we can use, so it makes that, that comparison very, very difficult. To combat this, um, as well as part of the curriculum initiatives that we've been working on in the district, we've really invested in a pretty robust um, assessment system uh, within the district, right? We've talked about tracking progress, the START 360, and interim assessments and all those things. Those exist because they serve kind of the same purpose of it as SBAC and, and Vermont Science Assessment. They give us the same data, but they give us data that's in much more detail that the teachers can actually use and dig into in real time and say, hey, you know, we taught these three lessons last week. The testing is showing us that the kids got these three standards and they don't understand, uh, you know, this, this one. So we need to go back and fix that right now. And so since those measures are here and in place, as the teachers are working in their curriculum teams, and there is a curriculum team for every one of the board's ends that has been working this year, um, they are taking a look at the interpretations and the rationales uh, based upon the board's ends, and they are adjusting them to take into account the deficiencies that we've had in the state testing system. And so everything that you see the next time you get an ends report, um, all those interpretations for the most part are gonna change. Doesn't mean that some might not you know, latch on to Cognia, um, but most of them have, have other ideas using the systems that we have within the school. Um, 
what I want to do, I'm going to apologize to the folks that are online uh, because I don't have a way of actually showing the little presentation that I'm going to show about the data. But if you listen, I'm going to describe it in explicitly graphic detail. Um, and I'll be happy to share this, this slide. Deck. Just put it here. So we'll talk about a few things. And again, this should only take a couple of minutes, but I, I think it's time to put a couple of things to bed. Um, since we don't have what we need from the state to prepare the ENS report, I think it's really important, like we were talking about, to show the community the district's performance with the information that we currently have. And some of it just came off the presses um, from our own internal data, like yesterday. So I was scrambling around about two hours before this meeting trying to put this together. Um, so I apologize if it's a little, little, little choppy. Uh, but I think presenting the data is important at this point in time because our teachers have done an amazing job um, especially over COVID, uh, to not only ensure the students were able to continue learning, but during the time of COVID, they actually improved their achievement levels. And that's a huge ask and it's a huge lift. And so I'm just making sure that some of the comments from, from the small groups and the crowds the last couple days that said the schools are not performing that well, um, don't destroy that morale um, because their morale is high about this work. Now, to understand things for the last couple of years, um, we have to talk about what I call it the RES anomaly. Um, we'll look at English, and then we'll look at math, and then we'll look at the district as a whole. In looking at the performance in these graphs here, um, it's important to understand what the graphs are telling you. Each chart shows the percentage of students who met the proficiency threshold set by the state. This particular slide that you're looking at um, shows that in 2019, 53% of the students at RES achieved proficiency or higher in English, which was above the state average. It's also important to remember what was happening each of these years. 2019 was the last kind of normal year prior to COVID. In 2020, there was no testing because COVID hit in March that year and schools went remote. In 2021, uh, we were in kind of remote and hybrid most of the year right up until the last couple of months. And then 2022, last year, which we do have some data we were able to pull together for, um, this year was in person, that, that, that 2022, um, but it was constantly disrupted. That was last year, right? We were shutting schools down periodically, depending upon how many staff were out sick with COVID um, and whatnot. Um, and I'm using the RES for these two slides because something really odd happened um, just at this school in 2021. Scores dropped dramatically at RES in both ELA and math, while Braintree and Brookfield scores jumped by five points each that same year. And at the same time, the high school saw a 10 percentage point gain in both ELA and math. Because this drop doesn't make any sense, that 2021, I call it the anomaly. Um, the most likely cause is the students and the staff Proctor and the SBAC just didn't take the testing seriously that year. Um, which is understandable given what was happening in the world. Um, unfortunately, because RES is a larger school, these scores in 2021 dragged down the entire district's performance a bit when they were averaged in. So it's important to recognize kind of the background. You see an uh, even bigger drop that year um, in mathematics at RES, right? It was a 40% point drop over one year. Um, so in 2022, you see it though, regaining everything it lost and then more. One late year later, they've not only bounced back, but they're higher than they ever were. And so again, it's just, it's quirky why that happened. Um, based on the data, it's like they just didn't take the testing seriously, the state testing, which was a culture in this district for a long time. Um, so that may have come out with the frustrations over COVID that year. So questions before I move into the, the, the bigger data that's more important. So this is SBAC data that you've managed to get. This, this is SBAC data. We do have individual student data so um, from the state. Um, so we've been trying to compile that. But we don't have you know, data aggregated by school. We don't have data really aggregated by the state um, at the state level. So that 22 number is a guesstimate. From no, we, we, took, we took every student in RES, we put it in a spreadsheet, and we did our averaging, which okay. was incredibly time consuming. Can, right, and, yeah. you did your own if aggregating. You, if you can imagine. I have a quick question. Sure. 
what you're it, it, assuming for the for the drop, I understand that. But why wouldn't the same apply to the other schools? More seriousness about the testing. Um, the idea, especially when I started the di in the district way back when, um, it was just testing was not important. <laughs> it, w it was that's that's what we, was said about it. Um, the testing isn't valid. It's not important. Um, when I talked with the faculty my first year here, they literally said it's never been a priority. We, that's not what we focus on, and that's not what we, what we worry about. So part of my work and the work of the cabinet for the, the first couple of years here has been trying to change that attitude. Um, but what's interesting is Track My Progress was running at the same time um, during these years. And Track My Progress correlates pretty closely to how the students perform on the SPAC. And the Track My Progress scores at RES were high. They were down a little bit from 2019, uh, about five percentage points. But they were high. You know, you would expect a little drop that year. That was a horrible year. Um, but so my guess is they got to the S back. They were tired. Um, in the old culture, you know, it was not unusual for um, the teachers to say, "Oh, you're taking an AP exam. Just blow off the S back." You know, that was the norm. And so but only at RES. But again, so I'm talking about past culture and how yeah. it might have influenced what they did. One of the reasons we think that the kids didn't, didn't take it seriously was because we can also go in and we can see how much time they took taking the test. Mm -hmm. If you got a two hour test, and I'm not exaggerating the numbers, and 56 of the kids spent 10 minutes or less on it, tells you an awful lot. Right. Yeah. So. Is that what happened? And so then you got a question, you know, what were the proctors doing? Uh, so, one of the things that we're working on. But anyway, I wanted to, I think that little drop that year is important. Um, and again, the gain that came back after it is also indicative is that, yeah, there was a, there was a quirk with the testing. Had that really been a 40% a, a drop, they would not have recovered that much of the year. Um, so there's that. So district's overall performance in English. So this is looking at every kid in the district as a whole. Um, and you can see that even with the drag caused by the RES anomaly, the drop was only one percentage point in 2021. Right? This uh, scale is a little off because the numbers are, are fairly close, to, close together. Um, in fact, without the anomaly that year, uh, the district would have actually shown a pretty big gain. In the spring of 2022, the district as a whole has increased markedly um, despite 2.5 years of remote and hybrid instruction and the disruptions caused by having to shut the schools down in classrooms as the virus continuously circulated throughout our population. The work causing these gains not only continues, but will accelerate this year due to the lessening impact of COVID. And an assistant superintendent to share in leading this work and the structures that we've put into place over the last three years to accomplish it. So even coming out of COVID, you know, you got 2019, you got the drop, a lot of that driven by um, like the, the RES impact. But even in 2021, in the middle of COVID, in the ugliest portion of that whole pandemic, we still had almost 47% of the kids hitting proficiency. We come back to 2022 a year later, and they got a three, four point jump there, um, right off the bat. And again, last year that that data is from was not a pretty year because we were constantly closing down classes and schools and whatnot. So the work that has been instituted is having an impact. We were also having gains. Um, the district was kind of at a low in 2017, 2019. It had started out high, and for years it was kind of declining. And then prior to COVID, the scores were going up slowly, and then COVID hit. And this is what the last three years looked like. So that's district in English, uh, district in math, um, district's overall performance in mathematics. Um, this is actually a, a harder discipline to maintain um, during the disruption because of the way the skills and knowledge builds on itself. Plus the fact, if you're looking at the elementary kids, a lot of them have to use physical manipulatives to understand the ideas, which is really hard to do when you're sitting at home and trying to have somebody on the computer talking you through it. But even given that, you can kind of see what happened. There was a, a bit of a drop, right? The RES anomaly struck. They were at 36% were hitting proficiency. Went down to about 29%. But the year following, they jumped back and they're higher than they were, um, right, 40%. And this is the district as a whole. 
So it's looking at every kid across the district. And now district-wide science. Um, the Vermont Science Assessment is administered in grades 5, 8, and 11, and of course it's going away. Um, only had been in existence for, for about two years where they actually collected and shared the data. Um, the work we began in 2020 reimagining the elementary science program along with the creation of the STEM program at RUHS has been paying dividends. Um, the district has seen a 7% point gain between the two administrations of the Vermont Science Assessment so far, and this is going to be updated in 2022. By comparison, and this we did have some data that we could figure out, we beat the state average in 2022 by 5 percentage points. So there has been some significant work that the teachers have been engaged in. We're not where we want to be, but things are on the upswing and they did some incredible work despite the most difficult of conditions. Now, I've got some two more little slides here that I think um, are going to be important and they're going to tell a huge tale. And I'll, I'll walk up there and I'll actually state the numbers and stuff for you so that this makes sense. So this is our track by progress. This just came off the presses, um, like I said, a, a day ago because they are doing the fall assessments using this tool. Uh, the high school is using STAR 360, so those should be coming out shortly. I'll be able to share these with you. But one of the things as part of the curriculum work that we've done is we've really built this robust assessment system. Right? We talked about it. it helps teachers track student performance over time and it helps them identify areas of weakness in terms of student learning so they can address those deficiencies right then and there. We test each fall, winter, and spring. We track my progress in STAR 360 and the data from these assessments is more valid than the state testing because like I said, our district had a long culture of not taking state testing seriously. The kids take these tests seriously. Um, and they are the equivalent of, of, of our SBAC and our, our, our grades and its assessment. Um, the data that you're seeing here is for elementary math. Like I said, it just came out. Uh, so what you see is the data represents the percentage of students who achieve proficiency or higher. If we go back to 2018 before COVID, in mathematics, 40 to 46 percent of the students in grades one for six were hitting the proficiency threshold. As of the end of last year, through the COVID pandemic, 77 to 79 percent of students are hitting the proficiency threshold. So it's almost doubled. Just as importantly, and this one is a pretty impressive number, in 2018, only 1 to 3 percent of the students were crossing the exceeds threshold, which is the highest score they can get. Last year, 46 to 49 percent of the students were falling into the highest score category. All this improvement happened during the disruptions caused by the COVID pandemic. Imagine what would have happened if we hadn't had the pandemic to interfere with the work that we've been engaged in. Here is ELA, right? Represents uh, English grades one to six. Um, the data you see represents the percentage, again, of students who achieve proficiency or higher. If we go back to 2018, before COVID, 35 to 38% of students in grades one to six were hitting the proficiency benchmark. As of the end of last year, 67 to 70% are hitting that proficiency threshold. More importantly, in 2018, only 4% of the students were crossing the exceeds threshold. The highest score, which is the highest score, last year 36 to 41% of the students were falling into that highest category. Right? So I think it's really important that we stop a lot of the nonsense that we're hearing about, you know, you need to be focusing on the academics. We are, and we have been. It's taken years um, to get the structures that we need in place to actually do this work. We've got them and they are working. We need to give them time to work with them. And things were improving even before we had these structures completely in place. The good works that people should be aware about that the district has, has, has put into place in the last four or five years is right, we expanded the preschool program we can now provide full day free preschool to all four year old students. We are essentially providing every student in this district with an entire extra year of education than they would otherwise have. And we're doing it at a critical time in their development. Um, and we're currently expanding the program for three year olds. That's what Pat Miller has been charged with this year and who is doing an exceptional job um, at that. 
Why is the, are the science scores going up? Well, besides the fact that we had an expert come in and help them develop a full science curriculum that they are implementing and providing them the resources and the tools to do that, we've also created a $500,000 plus K-12 STEM program and we're trying to evolve that into a full STEM academy which should be a draw for other students to, to come in from other schools. Um, the district through the budget process has also created a full-fledged curriculum team, something it never had to drive uh, the uh, academic achievement across every area of the board's end. 90% of this year's professional development time has been led by myself and by, uh, by Heather. Um, and that's where we're going to continue to dedicate our work. Um, we also implemented over the last couple of years that robust system of assessments to really provide feedback for the teachers to monitor the kids and how they're doing. In addition to all that, we have revamped the service delivery model for special education um, that also includes for the first time a dedicated professional development program that is designed just for the special educators um, to really have the most impact on the students that are most in need. Um, we've talked about this during the budget years. We have a, a very full, um, fulsome is probably the better word, support system for all students. We brought in the mental health and behavioral interventionists. We've expanded after school programming across all three schools. There is now an academic component that is going into that, academic, that, that after school programming. We provided summer programming for the first time last year to try to help the kids get caught up. We are going to continue to do that every year. Uh, that also included us busing the students back and forth to take advantage of it. And that has both an academic component for about half the time if they're with us and a social development component. And that is K-12. We also are revamping our tiered academic support system uh, within the district to make sure that all the kids that need help are getting the help that they need. Um, we're also expanding and been talking about this an awful lot over the last two years to connect with our high achievers. Um, we're talking about expanding the advanced placement program and we've got a new team that Heather is, is, is leading where we're looking at entering into the International Baccalaureate Program, um, which is one of the most impressive programs out there for a school to be connected with, involved with, that would lead to diplomas in IB uh, when students graduate. So there is a tremendous, tremendous amount of work that is going on and I need to say this a bunch of times um, do not demoralize my teacher by telling us that things are not going well with our academics. And that's not directed at you, that's directed out there. So, my presentation, I'm happy to answer any questions folks may have. So my question would be, how do we get that information out like over and over and over? Because it is impressive. Well, if we can get our website back up. Um, is the first part, but one of the things, um, and this is a piece that Heather picked up, which I, I think is awesome, is she's been working with and training the cabinet members on their newsletters and brought in a, a, a program that is specifically designed to create those, and that's a part of the PR work. Uh, one of the parts we are also, we'll talk about it tonight because you're going to get a request for funds a little bit later on, is we are revamping the website and a part of that vision is we need to have people within the district that are PR experts that are going out and taking pictures of this stuff and people that have some writing skills to write stories about it so that we can get this out not just in our newsletters and on our website, front porch forum and get it out to the press so that people are aware. And yes, that is the biggest efficiency right now is our, our ability to communicate exactly. I mean, I think in the interim, like that will take some time, right? It's all it's all pieces. Your, news, like your, your emails that you send out, I think people are reading them right now, so yep. that might be a great place to put it. Yeah, I got, I've got to learn the new, new newsletter software, which will take a little bit of time. They're, they're, they're old hats hat, it's going to take a little time to do that, but it's, it's a beautiful program in terms of what it does. Um, but again, remember in this district, this work. The focus has changed. There was a different focus. The board wanted there to be a different focus in the past, and the community did. Um, the focus has changed, and so a lot of this is being built from scratch. Um, so it, it takes a little bit of time, and then once you get it built, it takes some time to just let it do its work. You know, you get the stuff in, it's designed well. 
Um, you just keep letting it do its thing, and, and the good that it does spreads from there, but it takes some time. And these are a lot of big chunks and pieces. Um, most of what we talked about, especially in terms of those good works, that's a full-time job for one or two people. And remember, for a number of years, it was just me. Um, and so there was a lot of work that a lot of work that was done. That was awesome work. But I, I feel energized this year to have a team around me to be able to help accomplish this. And te a team that has incredibly good ideas um, and, and, and a lot of energy, which is which is really cool. <laughs> it really is. It's it's been a good time. So are the are the um, newsletters gonna are they gonna put out some of this information through the newsletters? Yeah. yeah so that may be coming soon. What one, one of the yeah. things that we've been struggling a little bit with, uh, plus they're setting up, you know, okay, it needs to go out on a regular timely basis, this is what we're doing. Some of the stuff that they've been putting out already has been incredible. I, I love the pictures that I see coming from the schools, especially because there's activities each time that even I'm not aware of. You know, and so it's, it's just, it's kind of exciting to see that. Um, but one of the difficulties that we're having is, you know, we built into the, built into the budget last year was revamping the website and also bringing in another uh, a tech person, right? They're, they're understaffed and we need somebody who can manage the website in-house. But we're trying to find that very special person. You're not just managing the website, but you're our PR professional. And we need you to help us get those stories and, and, and get that. And so that's been posted for since before summer started, and we still haven't found the right person. They will come. Um, it's just going to take a little bit of time. I don't know if that's a Sounds like there's a hands up. There is a hand. Well, there's a hands up, but I don't know if I'm allowed to talk at this part of the meeting. I don't know how this works. Am I allowed to talk? That's why I looked at the chair earlier when they asked me a question. It's her fault. Well, normally we have public comment when we're going to make, um, we're going to have an action. I guess I can ask the board if we're open to hearing a minute or two of comments. Or it's kind, it's kind of a, it's kind of a suggestion. With our okay. procedures. Sorry, okay. Email me. I will. Um, I will. Yeah. I. But I will say though, I'm. I'm impressed here. The stuff. It's very reassuring. And I also don't know how you guys keep track of all the numbers and stuff. That's all I'm going to say right now. Is the value that the families and the students placed on their education? That's it. They had the same problems. They had the same travails. I had 40% of the students that were there that were, that were free and reduced lunch were from, from really tough families because the next town over was Cambridge, and we had a, a lot of tough kids that came in from Cambridge. Um, but the reason that they excelled so well was exactly what Chelsea hit them. You have to believe that it's important. And a lot of the work that we're doing, the reason that we're focusing so hard on the academic piece and leaving all the other stuff behind that we used to do is because it's to develop that focus. If the teachers are walking in and that's what they're talking about and that's what they're working on, the kids pick that up and the kids start to realize, hey, they got some urgency about this and this has got to be something that I've got to get Well, and I think that's where our ownership language plan will come in as well. Yeah. Because getting the community engaged leads out. 
Yeah. So just one other thing that I really appreciate is having the student's GPA listed at the top of their report card every single time. Like that's important. And even though for a while it was proficiency based and it was confusing, I think having that number so that everyone can see it, it's students, parents, the advisors, everybody, it sort of brings it all together for that focus. I mean, you did. You had much, many. Much, right, you had right. I had many, few. but they're all for now, yeah. so I haven't seen them. But I appreciate them time. from a parental perspective, for sure. Okay, so moving on. Um, Lane, we had an update on team interpretations. Is that, that was sort of included in this mm -hmm. presentation, right? Yeah, that was the that discussion was the about the fact that the curriculum teams themselves, because a part of getting them invested and involved in the work, if I do it, the interpretation, yeah, it has, it has meaning, but it's not really connecting them. The vision is that they are doing the interpretation, right, based upon the ends. They're creating the assessment tools that they're gonna use to show progress toward it. They are going to explain the rationale behind what they chose, what it is, so folks can see that it's reasonable and fits in with best practice. Um, but they're also the ones that are going to be collecting the data because they need it to see how their kids are doing and to use it to inform their instruction. And they're going to be presenting the data to me each year. And then I'll use that to present it to you. And that's how it should be. As they're working on these things, when they're encountering difficulties, that's when they can come to me, because this is how a budget is supposed to be developed, and say, hey, you want us to achieve these things, we've worked on it, and our best, in our best estimate, these areas where we're struggling, if you give us X, Y, and Z, we can hit it out of the park. Or, we don't understand why the kids aren't performing well here, um, we need some professional development. And so the two things that should be coming from this work and why they have to be involved is they need to tell me what they need in the budget because they're the ones doing the work with kids that's going to get us there. And they need to tell me what professional development they need to be successful with the kids. Shouldn't be me telling them what they need. They need to tell me. And that's the goal. And I would imagine that has had a little bit of an impact on morale. They seem, at least for what the, the cabinet is reporting to me, and I spent some time talking a little bit about its interpretations with the math department yesterday, uh, did a little PD training with them. Um, they are quite happy with the new focus. Right? And that was the goal of this year. We want it to feel different. Trauma, we've done the work. Either you're implementing it now and it's helpful, great. If not, the reality is, is that nothing is going to make a kid feel more self-efficacious and valuable to the world to, than to know that when they walk into a classroom every day, the challenging things we ask them to do, they can do. If they're walking into a classroom every day because they've missed skills along the way and they don't have them and we're asking them to do challenging things, you're gonna have some grumpy kids, right? So some of the climate piece may be just that, more than the trauma, because there is trauma, but if you're walking into a classroom every day and you don't feel capable and competent, that's a problem. And that's what we want to fix. So, kind of where we're, where we're at and the things we're talking about. Sorry for all the time, but I'm passionate no, about no. it. So, that's uh, mm -hmm. feel very good. And I think as we work together with our ownership linkage, you know, sort of making sure that we're aware of kind of where things are going, so we can share that with the public and make sure we're on target, um, is going to be important. Okay, next up we have our board monitoring. So that is taking a look at um, our own board governance policies and evaluating them in terms of how we're doing. So uh, this time around we were looking at uh, 4.7. I. Um, I lined it up with the budget because we were going to be talking about the budget. I figured here we can we can at least um, maybe at least have it uh, coordinated. 
So, um, in this policy, hopefully everyone was able to take a look at it. Um, and I remember uh, last time, did we just sort of go through each section and kind of share how, how, how we rated ourselves? So I, will, I can lead off. So because poor governance costs more than learning to govern well, the board will invest its governance capacity. Um, I felt like, yes, we have been doing that. We, uh, in the summer of 21, we did the policy governance training with uh, Susan Mogensen. In the spring of 22, we did another policy governance training with Jackie Wilson. Um, and I'm imagining as we work um, with ownership linkage, we may um, be using some more um, training with Jackie on how to go about doing that with that portrait of my graduate uh, process. So that was my assessment. Anyone see things in there where we're like, wait a minute, no. Okay. Uh, the next section is uh, appropriating funds. Um, and I said, yeah, <laughs> yes, we've been, we, and we kind of went over that. We've been appropriating funds. We haven't necessarily been spending them all, but we, um, we've done that. Uh, what the next section is about training and retraining um, will be used to orient new board members and candidates for membership, as well as to maintain and increase existing member skills and understandings. And um, I was thinking we've, we've done a good job this year at sort of taking a look at that, with looking at kind of focusing on how we're running our meetings, making sure everybody is up to speed with sort of how things work. Um, anybody have anything else that they noticed or think we could improve on? And then the next section of that one was outside monitoring. Um, we do do the auditor's report, so <laughs> I kind of said we were like 50-50. I think some of, as we're continuing to kind of get our feet under us in terms of um, what we're doing, I mean, maybe we'll look at other ways. Although then I, I was thinking, in a way, the, um, the outside testing is sort of an outside monitoring thing, although we don't have an outsider from the state come in and speak to us about those test, like testing. But, um, testing like school testing? Yeah, like the SPACs. I mean, because yeah. it says in here, you know, uh, outside monitoring assistance will be arranged so the board can exercise confident control over organizational performance. This includes, but is not limited to financial audit. So, so I wrote always for that because I do feel like we get the state data, even though we don't get it yeah. on time, and that's an outside. Yeah, monitoring. well that's what later on, I was like 50-50 and then I was like, wait a minute, we actually do. And then we always do the financial audit. Yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah. All right, and then, um, this, number three, is the one we're working on. So outreach mechanisms will be used as needed to ensure the board's ability to listen to owner viewpoints and values. So, so I do feel like when we have these forms, I always feel like we've never done that in the past, but we're doing it now. Like, yeah, that, yeah. Like that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, so far, I think we've only had two or three, right? Mm -hmm. So. But that yeah. is the way I feel when I go through the list. I'm like, I don't think we did that at all last year, but I know we've been talking about it a lot this year. So. Right. Right. So I said not yet. <laughs> but we're working on it. Um, and, and so that's, that's pretty good. And then uh, number two, costs will be prudently incurred, though not at the expense of endangering development and maintenance of superior capability. Um, 
We haven't, what exceeded, did we haven't, we haven't exceeded our budget. Well, I, um, think, I mean, that would be, would also be always, because we discuss, you know, before making any decisions first, you know, regarding spending on our budget. Right. We do discuss the benefits of that. And when we were having trouble scheduling something, I think we were trying to make responsible decisions about yeah. what kind of return we could get for right. the cost. Right. Uh, so I think we've been right on with that. And then the board will establish its, its cost of governance budget for the next fiscal year when budget parameters are established. Yeah, we did, we did that today. <laughs> so um, we're, we're on with that. Um, so then we need to sort of look at which areas were rated as some of the time or rarely. And number three is staring right at us. Um, and we're working on it. We're going to, again, I think it's just putting front and center that, that need for us to work with getting out to the community, checking in with the community, getting feedback with, from the community in terms of, um, you know, sharing what we're focusing, what we're pushing Lane to do. Um, I mean, I do, I do just want to recognize that I feel like as a board, we're very, um, diligent to make sure that we promote the use of public comment at our board meetings. That's um, true. So I do want to recognize that. We do encourage people to attend our meetings and comment during appropriate times during public comment. Mm -hmm. Or um, email board. Yeah. Although I would say that one of the things that I think we need to think about and work as a board is we need to put some effort into reaching out to the community because relying on just people coming for public comment is not always it's not always getting what we need to to really be able to do our jobs and to keep us focused and moving forward in the direction that we feel the community wants the district to go. It seems I've got to a couple raised hands on. Oh. Uh, Wait, Rachel is, is okay, Rachel. Rachel's. Hey, I just have a logistical thing. I might lose my connection, and I see that later on the agenda there's an executive session. So I will, if I lose my connection, I'll log back in as soon as I can. But if, if I'm not in, um, and you go into executive session, if you could open that, because if I don't find you here, I'll look there. <laughs> That's I all. I sent a link out, it's an uh, electronic link to the board just in case. Um, a little while yep. ago, if that's helpful, yeah, for executive. Yes, session. yes, but but if I'm not like I'm, if I have lost my connection and you go into executive session, you're like, oh, she's not here. Let's not bother with the link. If you could bother with the link, that would be great. Okay. Talking about getting out to the community and being accessible to them. I mean, I don't know when the right time to talk about this is, but it seems like we could like make some sort of a outreach plan like honestly taking that that data and like standing there and handing it out to parents at some sort of game or something and being like look we're, I'm on the school board here's what's happening right now do you have any questions for me I mean it opens it opens it up for like what's appropriate to talk about and you might have to say I can't actually voice my opinion for the whole school board you know but let's have a conversation about it and it makes it accessible and it makes people feel like they're being heard and I don't know I don't think we do that it takes time we don't have a lot of time I don't know what the right answer is but I do share these coming, in open forums too coming at like a grassroots level and being accessible Maybe to the then. public is like one way mm -hmm. to, to do that's, that that's what our committee is going to be right right doing okay yeah. is working on that ownership yeah. linkage plan so how do we do that? So yeah, maybe, make a plan. I'm willing to do some. Maybe of that you want to be on the committee. No, too. but I'm willing to do some <laughs> of this stuff. Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> or well, and if you have ideas and you're not on the committee, okay. you know, you can send them to okay. one of us on the committee, yep. and we can okay work with them. So. So and so I, I mean again, and I'm hearing pretty loudly. Um, select one area of this policy for improvement over the next year. Ownership linkage. I don't, I don't think we disagree at all that that might be a a good idea. Um, 
and I think we can all sort of commit to, we're gonna create that ownership linkage plan, we're gonna follow it, get out there and start, um, you know, getting information and, and um, soliciting information from the community. Uh, so I think by next July, we should be able to <coughs> assess how did we do with our ownership linkage plan because by July this year will be over and we'll be looking to the next year to figure out okay what is our plan for this coming year uh, to uh, but let's have a plan before that oh yes yes no no by July Good. we're going to be assessing how well we did our plan. how well it functioned yes <laughs> so um, right all right, so next up we have, um, I sent you all information about the, the um, BSB annual business meeting. Um, is gonna be held at the, well, it's gonna be both at the conference um, in, in Lake Moray on October 20th and 21st. Um, we need, uh, to advise, we need to designate a board member to vote at the annual meeting. Um, you can you can um, attend electronically or in person. Um, did anyone other than myself sign up to go? No, okay. you, you did the proxy thing last mm -hmm. time and assigned you to vote. Right, that was for Visbit. This is for the for the VSBA. Oh, okay. This is a different one. So. Um, anybody want to go? Aren't you going together with Lane and Heather? Uh, Heather's, yes. Heather's going. Heather's going. And that also Lane's fulfills going. your I'm going. That fulfills the eight hours of training for yeah. the superintendent and the chair. Um, but the BSBA meeting is, I sent the information, so they've got some bylaw changes they're doing. They usually have some resolutions <coughs> from some other districts. Um, so, uh, that's our, that's the organization that supports yep. boards. I just can't go. You can't go. I just cannot. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> and, and, you know, if you can't make these things, there's a lot of information and resources on that VSBA website. And I think this year even, they're gonna like, I think they're gonna share some of the content of the conference on, on the, on, in some of their webinars. Um, so, you know, that's, a, that's a, you know, that can be an hour um, yeah. webinar that you, you know, when you have it, I know, we all struggle with like an hour here and there. But if, if you're looking for information. Um, so I'm going to be there. Do you want to, do you want to, uh, I'm willing to be our designate at the VSBA meeting. I move we authorize and to exactly. vote for us. Exactly. Okay. On our behalf. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. All right. Um, and anybody have any strong feelings regarding the information on on there? I mean, there was some bylaw changes and oh, some resolutions. Oh, on I, the, the, the agenda. Yeah, the agenda. If you've got some things that you feel strongly about, if you get a chance to look at it, just email me. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, and then that was just a reminder. So. That, that the conference is happening. I will share with you all um, stuff that I attend and what I find is interesting. <laughs> you can take it or leave it. Um, okay, next up we have the consent agenda. So that is our minutes from the last meeting. Um, we are doing a changeover of signers. Uh, on the school accounts, uh, we have an operational reserve fund request. Lane, do you want to tell us about that? We have three of them. 
We got three. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we'll start off with the facility reserve fund. Yeah, the first one. So the request for funds to update the OSSD central office software for 24115 And then we want to have an additional contingency amount for, for $5,000. So this, uh, we've, we've talked about this in the past, and I'll try, try to remind um, people uh, a little bit that five, six years ago, it was actually the first year that I started, um, the legislator passed a law that all districts were supposed to be using the same financial software. Mm -hmm. They went out, got a contract, and the software was horrible, um, wasn't usable. Um, they struggled to try to you know, enforce people implementing it, um, but it was so bad they finally kind of gave up. Um, during that time, we were not updating our current financial software because we were expecting to get the free software from the state once they worked out the bugs, which they never did. So we're in this position where the auditors are saying, hey, your software isn't doing what it needs to do. Um, you need to have, you know, like all the extracurricular accounts and stuff um, managed by it. And so at this point in time, with no clear indication from the state that they are ever going to have this resolved anytime soon, and after waiting five years, and after having the auditors tell us you need to do something, um, we're biting the bullet and we're taking the money to actually update that software. We have, uh, it's an $80,000 update. Um, we have most of the money in the regular budget. This is, uh, you know, this twenty-four, twenty-nine thousand 29000 is what we don't have for. Um, this money was put aside last year specifically for this purpose in the operation fund. What went into the operation fund was money to subsidize future budgets, to support the website, um, and to help us manage the software migration. So the money is there. Um, so that's the first um, one. The second one, which is the one that Linda handed out, I think you had one that came in, it's a, a separate piece. Um, this is to create our new website. And that was money that was put aside again in the operational fund. Um, we put a quarter million for these two software pieces because we didn't know how much it was going to be. Um, so this is 30000 to actually purchase the new uh, software. Uh, and that will come from the operational fund. Uh, we're working with Ben Merrill, um, who has been managing our old website. Um, but he has uh, created the websites under this platform um, for a couple of school districts around here. So he's going to do the initial creation. We're going to have a train the trainer session, and then the district will manage it itself from that point forward. Um, the problem with the old software was that it was created under a proprietary system. It was an individual who kind of created it all from scratch, and we don't have access or, or the, the, the specialties required to do it. Um, for a number of years, he decided he wanted to be out of the website business, was doing construction in Florida, um, and so we didn't have a lot of support outside um, from that. So this is a well-known, large company, going to be there, going to be around. Um, so it's, it's a good transition. So um, how quickly will that So I budgeted this be year. put in place? And get I, the over the course of this year, so how I budgeted things was we keep the current website up and running once we get it back online. And at the same time, they are doing the creation of the new website so that hopefully by the time we get to summer, we just do the transition. So we're, running, we're going to run parallel systems. Nobody's going to see the new website until it gets to kind of the beta phase. Um, but we'll keep everything on the old one so everybody is informed, has their access. And the, the second that this one is completely built and functional, with everything it's supposed to, then we transition and it should be seen. So that's the goal. Um, so by, by the end of the year uh, is the hope. Okay. Um, the last piece here is for 14375 That one's coming from the Facilities Reserve Fund. And the reason uh, that we're asking for this money is it's for additional radios, the high power radios. Um, and part of it has to do with making sure that we're keeping our security updated. Um, as we've been really enforcing this kind of one-door policy uh, uh, during the school day while the students are here, you know, everybody goes in and out one door so that it can be monitored. They've got buzzers, you can let them in, um, know who's going out. Um, the teachers, especially since COVID, are doing a lot of classwork outside, which they're continuing to do. So I need them to be able to have communication with the district. 
So as those teachers go out the door, they grab a radio from the front office. This also forces them to check in with the front office so they know that they're outside. And then if they see anything going on out there, they can contact us, or if something happens in the building, we can contact them and tell them what to do. Um, it's a large number of radios. Um, we really needed about 12. Uh, the remainder are to replace our age, parts of our aging fleet. We've got quite a number of them, but they're, they're, they're getting old, um, falling apart, not doing what they need to do anymore. So that's that piece. You need a 12, 12 radio? Uh, we're gonna, we, need, we need 12 new ones to cover the teachers, but the rest of that 25, the other 13, is to replace the aging ones that we have. So we have a bunch of radios already, but they're getting to the end of the useful. And they're expensive. They're usually, these are like the ones the fire department uses because they got to be able to get through the concrete in the buildings. Yeah. So, you know, they're, they're, they're 700 bucks a pop or so. Okay. And then, um, was that? Was that facilities? You took that from the, that one's that was in the there facilities too. one, yeah. right? Was the, the radios was the facilities. There's the facilities. Okay. And then the uh, audit engagement letter. Um, that's that's in your green folder. It's quite okay. a long thing. You have to sign. <laughs> yeah. But okay. We need the board so this, remember, as a board, we are the ones responsible for uh, engaging the auditor. So um, that's in here. This, this is the agreement that I will sign off on for the board. So, uh, do I have a motion to um, to approve the consent agenda? Uh, I have uh, two amendments to the minutes that I'd like to. Oh, okay. Um, I just noticed on page four, the date is September 10th, 2022. So, you want to um, correct that to September 14th, 2022? Two proxies that were signed by the um, by that I had to send in is the was so just, visit and BH. We just voted on her being the voting representative at the BSA BSBA conference, right? Just now, so I'm just wondering if that was that motion was regarding BHI proxy, not the BSA BSBA. Does that make does that make sense? Just making sure you voted on the right one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that one and last meetings, I'm assuming should have been the. Yes. The, the visit. Oh, yeah. There wasn't anything about the VSA, uh, VSBA business meeting. It was the proxies that we had. Yeah. So that needs to be changed then? Is that what I'm understanding? Am I, am I understanding this incorrectly? I get what you're saying. I don't have the people. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's in our, I mean, it's in the. Right, we just voted on this. It seems like we voted on it last time. Right? That's what I was asking when you guys Right, said right. Yeah, yeah that, this is for v Beehive Visbit which is different. So we did two, so last time you voted on, we voted on we, It was the VHI Visbit proxy. So that yeah. should be amended then to, to change. To say VHI Visbit. Instead of VSA, VSA, right here, right? Yeah, okay. No, because it's the VSBA conference, but we had, you had to vote on the proxy. There was a sheet there were two sheets for VisBet and two sheets for VHI, or one sheet for VHI. One was like unemployment, one was multi-line. I think it's a different vote than what she's doing at the business meeting when I think right, about it. Right, right, yeah. That but I don't know about the business meeting thing. 
Yeah, yeah, that was that's different. You didn't need any proxy or anything. No. Um, this is the beehive visit. And is, does that vote take place at the conference? It takes place at the conference. That's what it is. Yeah. So, so, so to okay, I get it now. Yeah. Uh, so I think tonight fine. was in case you have to vote on something else. That's for biz, that's for the VSBA, BA, which is different. That's the VSBA. Insurance versus uh, state school board. So the, the proxy thing. This is insurance. This is yeah. an insurance. It would be insurance if she's not going, if nobody's so going from the board, you could do a meeting, proxy, which would be pretty, pretty much voting the way that it's at the conference. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. My bad. I just the, the wording right. with what Linda um, had said. I was just thinking that maybe that was just not. Right. I'll change it if you want, but I no, think I, that's what no, it is. I mean, if, it's, if it is, yeah. like I said, the meeting just, takes place at the conference. Right. So now I move to approve the consent. <laughs> okay. I will second that. Okay. okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Rachel. Okay. Uh, discuss negotiations with the unions. I think we were just looking at um, I can give you the general, dates. Yeah. Dates when things are happening. So uh, the board's teacher negotiations team. Um, Actually, start start off at the beginning here. Um, the teachers and the support staff unions did did come back and agree to begin negotiations on their new um, contracts. Uh, for the teachers, the board's teachers negotiation team is Chelsea, Hannah, and Megan. First meeting will be on October 18th and will start at 6 p.m. in the RES Media Center. And then the future meetings are pretty much scheduled uh, every other Tuesday. Um, and so. In terms of the support staff, our team here is Ann Kotchett and Sarah. First meeting will be October 25th. Again, starts at 6 p.m. RES Media Center, and that's going to alternate on the alternate Tuesdays. So well, it should be a good busy time. And I do want to say this you know, publicly. I do want to thank the union um, themselves for being willing to kind of start this process earlier than we have in the past. Um, because I think that gives us a, a really good hope of, of reaching a fair settlement prior to the, the, the vote, vote on the budget in January, which is important. Um, we had talked about a planning meeting on Monday, mm -hmm. so I cannot make that meeting. Okay. If there's a, if there's a better day or time that, that works, we it can... It has to be before Tuesday, right? Um, the first session is really just exchanging what we want to exchange. Um, I, I was going to talk with the support staff to think about how late it gets afterwards. Um, there's really only two big things that I'm concerned about that's worth at least letting people know about. So we can do that at that time if we got a couple minutes after. After? Yeah. yeah, that would actually yeah. be after. So, I don't know if any others can do that. Well, it actually might not be bad for the support group to hear what the CBA group is, is, is thinking about. So wait, sorry. So we're not doing a Monday strategy. I don't think we can. It doesn't so we'll sound do like it we'll, have we'll do it Tuesday. Well, so we're having our our strategy meeting. Yeah, we're going to do it. The, we were going to do okay, it yesterday during meeting, the open right. forum. So we're going to have a regular meeting, and then we're going to have the strategy meeting after on yep. Tuesday, the eighteenth. Okay, we'll just send a new calendar thing. Thank yep. you. Sorry, sorry oh, to throw that okay. Do you mind repeating the dates for the support staff? Uh, support staff, uh, the first one is October 25th. Yeah, 6 p.m. 6 p.m. RES. RES Media Center, and then every other Tuesday, with, a, with an exception or two in there, which we'll cover. But typically what you do at the first meeting is um, you, you, you reconfirm the dates with each other. So that, that's tentative for now. And they were they were very flexible. They were they were they were enjoyed literally enjoyed to work with on this getting set. Nice. Okay, so no more dates. Uh, superintendent's report, the newsletters. I do really like those newsletters. Yeah, they look really um, good for me. Uh, 
financial reports? Do you have anything to add? How, uh, how are things looking? Are they looking yeah. as you would expect? Do a real quick one, and what I'll try to do is point out uh, the important stuff each time. If you flip kind of to the first page, so it's got the superintendent's report, then you flip over, you got that first page there. Um, if you go down to the bottom where it says other funds, and maybe about close to the middle, you see vehicle bus fund, building maintenance fund, legal fund, special education fund, operational reserve. Those are all reserve funds. So just so that you know how much is in them, um, and just to be aware of, this is money that's sitting there that you guys voted at, uh, folks voted at, at uh, you know, the last, what is it usually in, in March that you do this? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so that, that's money that is sitting there for future use. Um, right now, where things kind of stand is we're about a quarter of the way through the year, the fiscal year, so you would expect us to have about 75% of our funds remaining. We have 85%. Um, some of the lines themselves are under, you know, that 75%, but there are some things that happen during the year where you pay for them all at once in one month. Um, a lot of that is like contracted services. A lot of that work gets done over the summertime, so those will be a little bit lower than you would have expected. Um, some of the software, you know, lines and things like that, those will be a little bit lower than 75% because you pay that stuff up front at the beginning of the year. Um, surplus, and this is an important piece to talk about. We have had tremendous surpluses at the end of the year. Um, a lot of it has been due to the influx of influx of money um, through ESSER and whatnot and reimbursements and things like that. So what we've been doing for the most part is taking the bulk of that and spreading it out over three years to help subsidize future budgets. The, it's not confirmed until the auditors confirm it, but our surplus at the end of last year is $1.4 million. Um, one of the things that we might talk about uh, as we get to the future here a little bit is, you know, if, we, if we're having these significant surpluses, is putting a significant amount maybe into the operational fund or a building fund to start planning on the down payment on a new high school and a new cut center. Um, those buildings are old enough, um, right, that, uh, and, and we got some significant to work that's coming up this year. We got two boilers we need to replace. Uh, there's a lot of parts and pieces where, you know, three times a year we're spending a lot of money to replace stuff. It's getting to the point where it might be worth looking at new. The um, open forum that I did had 30 to 50 people for it, said, you know, what's your, what's your appetite for it? Uh, it was all thumbs up. Um, and what's the status with the state sort of looking at the... They have, a, as, as is the state's method, um, they put it off last year and asked for a study committee. Study committee is supposed to so, so it's supposed to report this December, um, and that supposedly is going to kick off the decision that they made. So we could see the decision this year in terms of like matching funds or, 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 or building building funds to help districts kind of renovate or, or rebuild. Um, so we, we shall see. Uh, anything else? Oh yes, this is a good one. Um, if you flip over, local revenues, the top number there on the left, $465,465. That is the money we earn because students from out of district want to come here as opposed to somewhere else. That is tuition money. So if anybody is telling you that our enrollments are going down, they are not. People are coming in from over quite a, a variety of different places to take advantage of the education. Um, we do have years, as I was looking at the enrollment numbers, um, we'll have years where it's up, it'll be flat for a year, it'll be up, it'll be flat for a year, it'll be up, but we have been growing. Um, and a lot of the work, the curriculum work, is that the, those numbers and those scores go up will be a draw, the, the Science Academy will be a draw. Um, if we build a new building, that'll be a huge more we can get those numbers up, the better off we're going to be overall um, in terms of finances. Um, every, every kid's another, depending upon whether they're coming in through tuition or coming in through our regular towns, every kid's another another eleven to, to eighteen thousand so, dollars. So when do we start the conversation about a new school? Like, is that a community forum? Um, I talked with. I've been through the process in Massachusetts. I have not been through the process in Vermont. 
Um, they have the process well written out as the AOE does a good job as there's a set of procedures to follow. Um, so Robin is getting those procedures we're going to start taking a look at. It. Recognize that usually the first step is coming in and having the study done. Where do you want to build it? You know, what are your priorities for the building? Getting the actual plans drawn up. Um, talk a little bit about the permitting depending upon things like watersheds and things like that. Um, that's an expensive process. That's about 100 to 110,000. It may be up now. That was the last time I did one. Um, and then that becomes the basis um, for having people bid and you know tell you how much they think it's going to cost. In terms of ownership linkage and help me fix my locker rooms, that kind of thing. <laughs> I think it building. might be a great conversation to have. What would you like to see in a new school before we get plans drawn up? So yeah. We can add some of that stuff. Oh yeah, and that that was a part of the discussion. So we we walked away with we want a new high school, new tech center. If we're going to spend, you know, 76, 78 million on a new building, then why not spend a million and a half more and put in a turf field with lights? Why not be, since we're central in the state, be the place where everybody, when it comes time for tournaments, comes to to use our facilities and charge them for the ability to do that? And I would also like to build a STEM academy that's a separate building and is also a museum, so that's used year-round and folks from all different towns can come and use that museum, um, take advantage of STEM educational opportunities that can be put on um, there, and, and that would be a, a kind of a pay for service as well. So we had some high-flying ideas, that's kind of what we talked about at that point. Yeah, all great ideas, but I think it's good to get the input yep. from like. Yeah, we're not at the point that, that that meeting was just, hey, do you have any interest? Yeah. Because if it was all thumbs down, I wouldn't even be bothering. Um, so action recap, we are going to have, um, I'm going to be checking in with Pietro to finalize the complete procedure edits and our procedures for our meetings um, and emails. Um, you want to be reviewing uh, all EL uh, monitoring reports 2.1 and 2.2. I'm going to be attending the BSBA meeting along with Lane and Heather, um, and sharing things that we learn. Um, and I'll be dealing with the Beehive and Visbit and the BSBA meeting. Um, and in your Folks online, we're going to be moving to executive session, so I will be shutting down the link for the main session. Uh, we will come back to that to close out the journey.